Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the GEO Institute Rock Mechanics Technical Committee Web Conference. All lines have been placed on a listen-only mode. You may submit your questions at any time over the platform by using the Ask Question button on the left side of your screen. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, Ron Young. Sir, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Hello and welcome to today, today's ASCE Geo Institute web conference on rock mechanics. I'm Ron Young and I'm chair of the GI Rock Mechanics Technical Committee. I will be the moderator today. We have four excellent presentations. Each will run 30 minutes, including the presentation itself and a question and answer period right after. Please feel free to post your questions at any time during the, pre the presentations. I'd like to now uh, take the opportunity to thank our gold sponsor, Hayward Baker, whose generous support helped make this event possible. Hayward Baker is North America's leader in geotechnical solutions. With a network of local offices across North America, each will with direct access to the largest geotechnical knowledge base in the industry, Hayward Baker is ready to respond with the optimal solution wherever the solution, whatever the size, whenever required. Solutions include foundation support, settlement control, ground improvement, slope stabilization, underpinning, excavation shoring, earth retention, seismic liquefaction mitigation, groundwater control, and environmental remediation. Hayward Baker is part of the Connected Companies of Keller, a multinational organization providing geotechnical construction solutions throughout the world. So with that, I'd like to introduce, uh, oh, actually I should go to uh, our, the program slide. Uh, so you, you see on, on the, this slide here the, the four presentations that are scheduled. Uh, roughly half an hour uh, each. Um, so the first one, uh, give, given by four of our esteemed uh, colleagues uh, on, on the committee, on the Rock Mechanics Committee. So we have uh, Ma uh, Professor Marty Gutierrez, we have Professor Riza Hadayat, we have um, uh, Dave Scapato, and we have uh, Dr. Fulvio Tonon as well. So. So without further ado, let me introduce the first uh, speaker, Professor Marty Gutierrez, who is James Patton Distinguished Professor and Director of the University Transportation Center for Underground Transportation Infrastructure at the Colorado School of Mines in Golden, Colorado. Uh, Professor Gutierrez, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Ron. Um, I'm just waiting for my slide. Hmm. Okay, go ahead. Right. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much again. Um, um, since this is uh, web conferences on case histories, uh, I'm delighted to present a very interesting and uh, very um, uh, the, uh, moving and very, for me at least, very dramatic uh, case history which involved, which involved a massive rock slide which occurred in the Philippines in the island of Leyte in 2006. Um, okay, let me, next slide please. Let me show you first where it happened. Leyte is an island about uh, an hour's flight south from Manila, which is the capital of the Philippines. And in that island, uh, a a three-hour drive south brings you to a village called Ginza Ugon. Uh, Leyte, by the way, is a very historic island. This is the island where General MacArthur landed uh, uh, towards the end of the World War II to try to recapture the, the, the country from the Japanese who had been occupying the, the island for four or five years. Uh, it is said that that invasion is probably the largest naval invasion in history. Uh, the only other ma bigger one is the one that happened in Troy uh, uh, in, in ancient Greece, but that's uh, uh, a thousand ship, like they say, but that's uh, more or less mythical. But this one is truly massive. Next slide, please.
Okay. All right. Uh, this is a uh, sorry. I keep on jumping. So this is a, a picture of the slide, uh, the area that was devastated right after uh, the slide happened. Um, you can see here the extent of the slide. The, the, there's a debris zone, the first upper lap uh, slide. There's a debris zone. There's another debris zone downstream. Uh, the third picture was taken by a U.S. Navy uh, photographer. You can see again the massive slide. By the way, the, the mountain, the height of the slide is about 800 meters. So that gives you a scale. There's another village downstream that hasn't been reached by the slide. There's a river. But where it is covered by the debris, there was a village here, and I'll tell you more about the impact of that, on the, of the rock slide on that village. So the, uh, the uh, rock slide occurred about 10.30 in the morning on February 16. These are some of the statistics on the, on the, on the impact of the slide. Uh, reported missing were about 1,300. They were never recovered, actually. Uh, the only recovered bodies were 122, so it's about uh, 1,400 uh, uh, people who were uh, affected, who were killed, um, and as I said, only 122 bodies were eventually recovered. Areas that were affected is 210 acres, which is uh, used for planting of rice, another 80 hectares which plant, uh, planted to coconut. About 350 houses were destroyed including an elementary school with about 300 students and teachers in attendance. Uh, this, uh, in terms of volume, if you can compare the volume, this is probably one of the largest one. I have a, here a table of the, of the major slides that had occurred in, in, uh, in history, uh, taken from stone, and then uh, you will see that the volume of material from the latest slide is about 15 to 20 uh, million, uh, to, uh, 15 to 20 million cubic meters uh, compared to others which are uh, in the order of 13. The largest one, of course, was the one that happened after the, uh, the volcanic eruption in Washington in 1980. But this is, is, still remains one of the, one of the biggest, bigger ones. These are some of the pictures of the, of the uh, area that's being impacted. There is here a building which housed uh, uh, staff from the National Irrigation Administration. This is one of the only few buildings that um, more or less still had some parts of it remaining after the slide. The next slide, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it keeps on jumping. All right, this was a, next one is a picture. This is a satellite imagery of a side viewing uh, slide area taken by JAXA in 2006, right after the slide. And it shows you again the ex extent of uh, the travel. The travel, uh, the, 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 the debris traveled as far as three to four kilometers from the base of the mountain all, all the way to the tip of the slide. These are the types of the debris that we investigated. We classified the debris into four types. The first one, you see this big massive block. Um, it's as big as a, a small building, uh, maybe a small bus. It's very interesting that this block got here actually by flying. This block flew and hop, jump over uh, several, uh, several times to reach this place and remain intact. Uh, this was uh, verified by several, several uh, uh, witnesses that they showed this flying back right up to the slide. The second one, the one, uh, uh, on the right, top right, is another type of debris. You have a block inside, but it's covered by, by uh, soft material, ground material. The other ones are softer material again, which rained into this area. And the last one is very interesting. Um, these, these mountains are isolated. You see these mounds of uh, debris all over the area. And our uh, hypothesis is that these were soft blocks of rock that uh, also jump, hop over, and then suddenly, uh, finally when it landed, it collapsed and created the mound. There's no other way to explain it. These were not transport, transported uh, by, by having the debris running, but uh, the only way it could have gotten there is that it, it imploded, a type of a uh, soft rock that landed and imploded. We look at inside and we try to dig in and we couldn't find any hard material inside this debris. This is a picture, panoramic picture of the 
of the slide, you can see here at the top picture where the scarp, the big scarp again to give you a scale, the height of that uh, mountain is about 800 meters. There is a river at the bottom. You can see that most of the slide uh, flew from the top going to the left of the picture. And you can see here some uh, coconut trees. There is a small mountain here. This is where some of the blocks jump over. The only way that some of the debris could have deposited here is that if the block flew over this mountain and this mountain remained untouched. This is a view of the debris uh, taken from the top of the mountain, the one at the bottom, the picture. Okay, so this is how we classify the movements of the debris. Um, they're basically uh, uh, different transport mechanisms. There are mechanisms by, uh, by which they were, the debris was uh, uh, moved from the, uh, uh, the initial slide at the top of the mountain and transported downstream. As I said, some of, the, some of the big blocks were transported by having them hop over and jump over um, the vegetation. The, the main flow is, however, is a mixture of uh, soft and hard rock material carried by water. I will, um, um, uh, I will discuss later and, 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 and point out that the main cause of mechanism, main mechanism for the initiation of the slide is rain, rainfall, heavy rainfall. So there's a lot of water. Uh, so the water carried away most of the slide downstream, which, as I said, is a combination of, uh, of uh, large and small blocks in all sizes. And then the other uh, uh, transport is by mud flow. That is, uh, finer materials are carried out downstream into along the direction of a river. There used to be a river ex extended here. So again, you have rock falls, rocks, large pole, black rock falls. You have large blocks of rock uh, that created an avalanche. Uh, you have a mud flow, uh, the main flow, which is a mixture of uh, large and small material and a mud flow. So you have all kinds of transport mechanisms occurring at the same time in this landslide. So the, regarding the type of materials that we find, the geology and the morphology of the site, most of the soil is volcanic. Uh, from the later Central Highland Volcanics. There used to be an active volcano south of the village. Uh, in addition, we have sedentary rocks. There's also conglomerates, and there are also breccias. There is a major fault zone that passes through here, the later fault zone, and that produced a lot of the breccia material found in the area. Um, this is a picture of the, of the mountain before the slide happened. So this block, please remember this big, big block, because that big block is the block that eventually fell off. So that's the press slide picture. Okay, so what triggered the slide? What, what, what was responsible for the slide? Well, the slide happened, as I said, in uh, February 16 and 17, I'm sorry. And days before that, there was a tremendous amount of uh, rainfall. Now, the rainfall was caused by La Nina, which is the opposite of, uh, of uh, El Nino, uh, which uh, results in uh, severe temp temperature changes in the Pacific, and that carried a lot of uh, moisture westward to the Philippines and created a slide. Uh, the maximum rainfall was about uh, 850 millimeters, which is on uh, February 12th. And then, as I said, it was followed by the slide a few days later. What is interesting is that the rainfall was mainly concentrated on the island. So you see this red zone and the last figure at the bottom. That's where most of the rain occurred. So there's a lot of concentration of the rain. Another thing, too, is that the mountain creates an inversion zone. That is, the moisture coming from the sea uh, rises up uh, through the side of the mountain and accumulates at the top. So, so there's potentially a lot more rain uh, at the top of the mountain than at the station where this uh, rainfall was recorded. Okay. Another thing, too, is we thought that maybe uh, uh, earthquakes could have caused the landslide. 
This is the Philippine small zone again. And during and around the, the time of the slide, there were several small events that were recorded. The maximum was about 4.1 uh, magnitude. Uh, moment magnitude. So we're wondering whether the, the earthquake also uh, created the slide. And it's, it's not the rain, but maybe it's the, the earthquake. So uh, this is the fault zone again. There's a lot of, uh, there's a main fault. There's a lot of riddle, splay, uh, riddle type fault and splays uh, that are oriented, conjugated to the main fault. And the, and the village is, again, crisscrossed by several faults. Now, these faults are very interesting because uh, they will play a significant role into the uh, nature and the uh, initiation of the slide. So, following that one, the following the event, I tried to raise money and I was able to get some grants from the Nationalist Foundation to organize a reconnaissance survey. One of the, uh, our objectives is uh, to understand what caused the uh, uh, rock slide, what were the initiating mechanism, the extent, uh, where it occurred, and uh, also to try out uh, different technologies, including LIDAR, digital uh, 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 photogrammetry, and uh, digital GPS to survey the slide. So this is the LIDAR that I have. Uh, this, this was purchased to a previous uh, NSF grant, and these are some of the local people that helped me uh, bring the slide to the the uh, the, the lidar to the site. Uh, these are some of the toughest human beings I've seen in the world. Some of them are just barefoot. Uh, this guy in red uh, T-shirt, he carried the slide every time. Uh, very strong. Uh, the the lidar must have weighed about uh, 30 kilos, so carried the slide in a basket and. And uh, I myself barely survived the hike, which uh, took us half a day to get to, the, to this site. Uh, the person here in the second picture is a student and the local one of the local geologists. Uh, the bottom left figure is uh, one of the, right, uh, one of the uh, scans that we have. This is a 3D cloud. This is the, the appearance of the scarp right after the slide. And um, we were stationed about a kilometer away from the slide, and the, the LIDAR was powerful enough to capture the, the, the surface, including the undulations of the surface, which was very important in our modeling. We also did digital uh, photogrammetry. These are two uh, superimposed uh, pictures, the one on the right-hand side, the bottom one, two superimposed pictures uh, of uh, digitally taken uh, Images which were simple for so we could see the slide in 3D with the use of 3D glasses. This is us uh, climbing the scarp. This is the main scarp, and this is now very interesting. This was our uh, our aha moment when we realized that this was a fault. Initially, when we were far away, we were thinking, um, you know, that this was a created surface. Uh, when the sun hits the surface, it starts to glow. It's very bright. It's slick and slided. So we thought that the slick and slide was created by the slide. But on the contrary, this looks like an existing fault, a fault that hasn't been mapped before. This was hidden. It's undulating, and undulation is perpendicular to the direction of the slide. So this is, uh, uh, you can see the the, um, some 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 sense, uh, some uh, proofs of movement of the slide downstairs, but still the undulations are parallel. So it's a slick and slide. You can see here a propylometer that gives you an idea of the roughness of the slide. So again, this was an existing fault, a a, a splay of the, the Philippine fault zone. It's pre-existing, but it hasn't been uh, it hasn't been mapped before. So, uh, but uh, but then. Uh, we realized that this was where the major slide uh, occurred, uh, and this is what triggered the slide. Uh, we did more mapping of the area, looking at the rock formations around the, around the, the, the exposure. Then, uh, based on the LiDAR survey, our, our photogrammetry, we did then, we were then able to identify the main scarp and the failure planes. There were basically several failure planes. The main fault, uh, the vertical shear failure surface of this surface was sheared. It failed. 
when the main pole slide. There is a green zone here, also a, a slide. Uh, and and uh, after the initial slide, the, the rocks plowed into the rock formation and then created the left uh, bottom ballast that we have here. So as I said again, the fault is smooth, perpendicular to the sliding direction, yet undulating uh, perpendicular, uh, parallel to the sliding direction. So this is the, following the, following the, the survey and following the identification of the failure zones, we then created the digital ele elevation model of the, of the, of the rock slide with the different uh, failure zones that we have identified. Again, the main fault is display of the Philippine fault zone, and that's where the slide was created, first created. Having the digital, this is again the digital element model. This is actually, we did the digital ele elevation model. Also, it was eventually our di uh, distinct element model of the slide. Uh, this was the SCARP with the main uh, detached block and the exposed processes. So we modeled the whole thing using 3D, uh, a code developed by TASCA, three-dimensional three element code, and tried to model the triggering mechanism as well as the eventual uh, flow of the slide. Uh, we were able to characterize the roughness of the, of the uh, fault zone, the main fault zone, using the barton bandish joint model, which requires a roughness coefficient and a strength. The roughness coefficient was basically measured from the uh, propylometer and from the LIDAR survey. The JCS we measured simply from Schmidt Hammer, which we brought with us in the, in the, in the, um, in the field. And the residual of basic friction angles are based on wetted uh, uh, properties of quartz surfaces. And we scaled the JRC and JRC, JCS to the, to the length of the fold. So we investigated uh, the different mechanism, the triggering analysis. What we did was that we tried to fill up the main fault with water. We tried to fill up the fault with water, so the main fault became very pressurized because of the water in, in four steps, uh, from one-fourth, one-half, one-third, uh, uh, one, uh, three-fourths to full fault, and then we apply the pressure and see whether we can push the black out of the mountain. So this is an analysis. If we hydro, uh, pressurize the fault to one half to three port height of the fault and fill, uh, rather fill up the fault with only one half water or three ports water, we are not moving the fault. We're just simply creating a small opening. That is, we are parting the fault uh, perpendicular to its uh, normal direction, but there is no horizontal movement. And then when we increase the pressurization and fully fill up the fault, then we see that it started to move horizontally. So you can see here a sudden movement in the, in the fault. Uh, look at the vectors here. You see it started moving. So it seems that the fault was only triggered and the fault only failed when it started to be fully uh, pressurized. There's a huge, uh, tremendous amount of evidence uh, the, that shows that uh, there's a tremendous amount of pressure that had built up in the fault. Uh, days before the slide, people were absorbing uh, um, water springing up at the, at the village, uh, the bottom of the, of the mountain. Uh, one of the big uh, springs that sprouted out was inside the church, so created a big fountain, and again, that points out to some of the evidence of potential pressurization of the fault. And again, please remember there was a tremendous amount of rain uh, right before the slide. So this is uh, the debris flow simulation, the initiation. So we apply the, the fault and then the, the, the fault uh, slid. It fell through and then afterwards started to break. And you can see here the breakage of the, of the, the rock into fragments. Uh, and then we continue the simulation further. This is some of the displacement vectors, how it moves. Uh, so the initial directions of the displacement vectors are getting forwards to the downwards and then moving to the left, which is very similar to the uh, main sense of uh, fault movement and main, main sense of flow that was observed from the study of the debris material down the slope. 
uh, we were able to model also some of the extent of the distance of the debris traveled. Some of them traveled as far here. And moreover, we were able to simulate the dynamic process that was observed, which involved the jumping and the hopping of the blocks uh, uh, as it uh, tries to follow uh, uh, down the contour of the valley. So, uh, summary and conclusions, uh, we conclude that the, the failure type was a rock slide. So the main triggering mechanism was a rock slide followed by avalanche, debris flow, and map flow. We were able to investigate through our uh, field study and numerical modeling that the, the failure was caused by sliding uh, along an existing rhythm fault, which is a display of the Philippine pole shown. So initially it shielded along and a shear on one of the sides and then sliding along the bedding planes. The triggering mechanism is rainfall, only rainfall. Uh, we tried to add earthquake at the same time, and we look at earthquake as a potential triggering mechanism, and we, we could not have uh, the earthquake uh, move the rocks. Uh, the sorting and the distribution of debris was controlled by topography and surface water conditions. Uh, it's probably a potentially uh, rare event, uh, but due to confluence of many mitigating factors. Uh, it's probably part of an ongoing process of uh, mice mass waiting in the area. There have been, uh, in, in its history, there have been several cases of similar uh, 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 rock slides, but not as big, but it's, it's an ongoing process. Um, uh, given that this is a potentially reoccurring process, this is conclusion to the potential impact of relocation of inhabitants at the boot of Mount Kalyan, which were the where the mountain occurred. I mean, the big issue is that uh, uh, several people were relocated and the uh, inhabitants were clamoring to go back so they can farm their land. And the question was that um, are other areas also potentially susceptible for similar slides in the future? So that's the big question that we wanted to answer. Uh, as I said, this was a very moving event. We were there uh, three times. Uh, you could see the suffering of the people. You could see the concern that they have to their future livelihood um, and uh, um, trying to understand what happened. They think it's a very important part of the process so the people can try to be, rebuild their life and decide whether to move back to their villages or not. Um, I wish I had more time. It's, uh, I can tell you thousands of stories about this, but uh, for now I will stop. Uh, so. I will be happy to uh, ask questions. Again, the, before I end, this is uh, the complete picture of the slide. When we first saw it, we stopped uh, at the distance and we were just awed at that, how huge this one. And we were just standing there. I could not believe how big this slide was. Uh, again, this, the mountain is about 800 meters and the slide traveled uh, about four kilometers down from the foot of the mountain. I thank again the National Foundation and the paid in endowment for the support we have uh, uh, received in the duration of this uh, uh, work. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. So, um, Marty, if you go to the questions, uh, we have one question from the audience. I think uh, Dave uh, has also a question, too. Uh, let's start with the audience question. What would be the possible solution of such slides? Uh, that's a very good question. This is actually one of the uh, uh, main questions we were asked, too. I mean, uh, what would happen if such potential start had, has the possibility to occur in the future? I don't think we can slide. We can, uh, I stop the slide given the magnitudes and the potential magnitudes of similar slides in the future. The best that we could do is to monitor the mountain, provide monitoring stations, all kinds of monitoring. The very basic uh, monitoring will be uh, amount of rainfall. It seems to be the place is very susceptible to rainfall induced slides uh, given the uh, high amount of precipitation that happens. So that will be the very basic uh, local stations at different places. Maybe develop a criterion to try to say that, okay, when the, when the waterfall, uh, rainfall has accumulated to this level, then it's time to, to, to evacuate the people to safer ground. Mm -hmm. uh, the other, of course, will be more advanced monitoring with uh, movement sensors similar to the types that they have in Norway. Mm -hmm. um, of course, 
frequent investigation by geologists and visits to the site, uh, remote sensing, uh, those are the things. So a, a very um, uh, credible and reliable monitoring system could potentially avoid similar incidents in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So, so thank you. So Dave uh, Scapato has has this question. He, he was wondering if there's a chance uh, more failures will occur over time? I, I think there are similar blocks that are overhanging blocks, almost similar shapes. Uh, smaller than this, of course. Uh, I, I think the potential is there. If we hmm. do get similar concentration of rainfall and with the global climate change occurring, I won't be surprised if we get something similar, uh, if we have uh, large amounts of rainfall again in the future. In the future. I see. So let's see. Oh, oh, okay. So, so Marty, can you see the the other questions as well? Uh, I've only. Seen if you click one... on the Q plus eight uh, button right on the top, you you I... should be able to see the the questions. I've only seen one so far, the one by Mr. Itani Frem, about the potential solution of such slides. Okay. There, so, yeah. So okay, I, I see another one. Okay, so maybe yeah. I, I can ask that. What was what is being done to use the results of this study to develop effective prevention or prediction tools? Um. Yeah. So. It, uh, yeah. There's, there's currently a lot more work going on. For example, the use of lidar which mm -hmm. is uh, very powerful, and I think my colleague, uh, Professor Tonan, will talk about it. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're trying to refine uh, uh, a lot of the techniques that we have in, 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 in remote sensing and monitoring. Uh, given the, the remoteness of the area and, and accessibility and difficulty of actually instrumenting the area, I think uh, the best way to, produce, to proceed in the future is by a remote sensing, a very accurate way of remote sensing, of detect, detecting uh, minor movements that could uh, um, potentially be used as, uh, as indicators for potential uh, triggering of the slide. Uh, of course, we have to develop a, a very good criteria to, to decide what is a, a good uh, indicator for slide mm -hmm. in the future. So a lot of work needs still to be done. And I must say that you know the, 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 the impact will be tremendous. This is the, not just research, as I said, or, you know, 1,400 people were killed here, and then their livelihood were taken out. So uh, uh, we're impacting a huge uh, uh, number of populations, similar populations all over the world who live in uh, areas that are exposed to heat. So we need to continue the research, and uh, particularly, as I said, in terms of remote sensing and, okay. and prediction. Right, right. Okay. How about uh, let's let's go with one last uh, question before we move on to the next uh, presentation. Pos is it possible that earthquake-induced seismic waves cause pressure perturbations in the fault? Temporary high pressure conditions destabilize the fault. Is it possible? Uh, that's that's a very good question. We uh -huh. dwelled on this one in our modeling to a large extent. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. What we found, there was a big question about the timing of the slide in relation uh -huh. to the timing of the earthquakes. Uh -huh. there were, one thing is that there, there were several earthquakes around the slide, so we cannot really decide whether the, the, the earthquakes uh -huh. occurred before the slide, uh -huh. uh, but our modeling indicate, and we also measured the amount of seismic event that was created by, by this slide, we realized that the, size, the, the magnitude of energy released by this slide was so large that it could have created the, the earthquakes that happened later. So I think I we, we are quite convinced that the slide, the earthquakes are, are well produced by the slide uh, instead of the other way around. I see, interesting. Very good. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Professor Gutierrez. Thank you so much. So thank we're going to move much, on. Uh, for yeah, thank your you. Attention. Thank, thank you. Everybody. you. Thank yeah. So we're going to move on to the second presentation. It's going to be by uh, Dr. Riza Hidayat. Uh, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Center for Underground Construction and Tunneling at the Colorado School of Mines in Golden, Colorado. Uh, Professor Hidayat, uh, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Ron. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah, yeah. 
Yes, perfect. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity, and uh, hello, everyone, for, uh, and thanks for coming uh, to this uh, event. Uh, my name is Reza Hedayat. I'm an assistant professor at the uh, Colorado School of Mines, and I would like to take this opportunity to uh, go over the topic of uh, tunnel squeezing uh, and essentially excavation of tunnels in squeezing uh, rock conditions and focus on uh, case history uh, as part of this uh, presentation. So I'd like to start uh, with the outline of uh, this work, uh, which is essentially the squeezing ground uh, condition and the definition. Uh, the main objective of the presentation is to introduce the squeezing ground uh, conditions and also the interaction between the support system uh, and the ground. Uh, a criteria has been developed in the literature for predicting the squeezing conditions, and I will review that criteria uh, as part of this presentation and uh, focus primarily on a very interesting case study that is uh, considered as one of the most challenging uh, tunneling projects uh, in the world. Uh, a tunnel project that's located in Venezuela that I will talk about uh, more uh, and discuss and conclude with some of the major findings and the advancements uh, and the contributions that were made uh, to the rock mechanics field as a result of this uh, tunnel construction. So let's just start first with the definition of the uh, squeezing ground. Uh, by definition, reduction of the tunnel cross section that occurs as the tunnel is being advanced is considered as the squeezing. Uh, a perfect example of the squeezing can be seen in this picture. Uh, if you look closely, you can realize the difference in terms of the cross section of the, the tunnel as shown in this picture, uh, which is primarily due to the severe squeezing uh, that has happened during the construction of uh, this tunnel in uh, Italy. Uh, according to the work of the Commission of International Society of Rock Mechanics, uh, squeezing is uh, considered uh, as the large time-dependent convergence uh, of the tunnel during the excavation. And it happens for several reasons. Uh, it can be a combination of the material properties, uh, the rock mass behavior, as well as the induced stresses, either because of the uh, in situ stresses or the disturbance in the stresses as a result of the tunnel construction. So to kind of summarize, by definition, a squeezing is going to be a time-dependent process. Uh, it can be primarily either due to the rock consolidation or the creep phenomena that would happen. And in many cases, a squeezing is associated with uh, instability conditions, either uh, at the face of the tunnel or at the uh, walls of the tunnel. So it's a very important phenomena to be considered uh, and uh, evaluated. One of the challenges, however, is that squeezing potentials uh, are quite uh, difficult uh, to evaluate, especially at the design stage, and they typically result in significantly higher costs for the excavation and the support of the tunnel. Uh, quite an interesting uh, chart is shown here in this plot as a result of the work of uh, Professor Everett Hook. Uh, in this area, he is one of the leaders uh, uh, that has worked uh, quite extensively, and this presentation is, in fact, built upon uh, many of his contributions uh, in the literature. So if you simply look at uh, the different uh, tunnel spans, let's, we can, for example, consider the example of a tunnel span of 10 meter or about 33 feet. Uh, you can see that uh, based on the, the cost associated with the excavation and the support of the real tunnel cases, the cost of tunneling in a squeezing ground can be uh, at least one and a half times uh, higher than the cost of tunneling in average uh, ground. So that's essentially one of the major challenges associated with the squeezing ground. So now, given that introduction, let's have a, a very short and brief look at the ground and support interaction and the way that the support system is supposed to be uh, resisting the deformation of the ground. You can think of the support systems in the form of uh, I would say at least for the conventional tunneling methods in the form of either shotcrete, rock bolt, uh, or a steel set, or maybe a combination of all those to be able to provide some sort of internal support uh, to resist the deformation of the ground. Obviously, if we provide the same support as being uh, the in situ pressure, the ground deformation would be zero, but uh, it's obviously not very economical to provide, uh, or even in some cases feasible, to provide significantly high internal uh, support pressures to restrict the ground deformation. 
and uh, in many cases it's beneficial to allow the ground to deform uh, to, uh, uh, to the tolerable extent and then install the support system and uh, try to reach equilibrium by uh, providing just enough support uh, so both the support and the uh, ground would reach equilibrium and uh, limit and restrict the deformations to a tolerable extent. That's essentially the whole idea. But obviously, as we let the ground deform, uh, we induce some damage uh, zones around the tunnel, and this damage zone uh, development would be a function of the internal pressure uh, provided by the uh, support system. So what you see here in this uh, picture, in this uh, uh, slide, essentially is the interaction uh, between the ground and the support system and the, excuse me, and the equilibrium uh, that can be uh, achieved uh, by uh, construction of the, uh, the support. So uh, technically, uh, when uh, the damage zone uh, builds around the tunnel, we have uh, several areas that are going to be deformed and disturbed. Uh, one obvious area is going to be the wall of the tunnel, uh, but similarly, the face of the tunnel also uh, shows some uh, damages and some disturbance. Uh, so simply looking at the figure on the left side, uh, we can see the illustration of the formation of the plastic zone around the tunnel face uh, and also the failure of the rock mass uh, surrounding the circular tunnel. The right figure schematically shows the profile and pattern of the formation uh, in the tunnel. So one can imagine that uh, if we consider the face of the tunnel as the circular cross-section or half-circular cross-section shown uh, in this figure, if we move ahead of the face, uh, at a distance of about two times the diameter, the displacement uh, of the uh, rock mass is going to be more or less uh, about zero or fairly negligible. And if you walk back from the face uh, at a distance of, again, about two times the diameter of the tunnel, the displacement of the wall is going to be reaching the maximum value. So simply observing the displacements at the tunnel and having an estimate for the displacements is the, uh, is the critical step for evaluating the squeezing potentials, uh, both at the design and the, and the construction stage. So uh, based on this observation here, uh, you can see the, in this slide the results of the numerical modeling that was uh, done by uh, Dr. Hook in one of his uh, references. Uh, the left side shows an example tunnel, uh, which is uh, 8 meter uh, in diameter, 24 feet in diameter, and the displacements at the wall as well as the face of the tunnel uh, versus uh, uh, the applied support pressure are shown here uh, in the form of ground reaction curves. I apologize for the uh, uh, blurry in the picture. But typically, as you just simply look at the trends of these curves, they show uh, how much the ground uh, is going to deform as a function of the applied uh, support pressure. And uh, both the face and the wall kind of show similar patterns, but obviously the displacement at the tunnel face uh, is a smaller than uh, the displacement at the wall of the tunnel, uh, but they show and follow more or less a similar pattern. So one of the main uh, contributions of Dr. Hook to this uh, literature was that based on the observations uh, from the field and also the results of numerical modeling, he realized that if we simply take the displacements and divide them by the radius of the tunnel and present the data in the form of a strain, as a function of the rock mass strength uh, divided by the in situ stress, uh, some interesting and uh, uh, informative patterns uh, uh, and, uh, can be observed, essentially. What you see on the left side is the relation between the strain in the tunnel being the ratio of the deformation to the radius as a function of the rock mass strength uh, divided by the in situ pressure. And uh, more or less about the value of 0.2, you can see that as the uh, rock mass strength uh, ratio to the in situ pressure uh, falls below this uh, value of 0.2, the amount of a strain asymptotically increases, uh, indicating uh, that a strain in the tunnel or the deformation similarly is going to be significant as the rock mass strength uh, becomes less than one-fifth of the in situ pressure. So based on this, and also some similar work done by other researchers uh, based on the observations in the field, confirming that uh, strain levels of uh, more than 1% are typically associated with some sort of instability uh, for the tunnel, uh, Dr. Hook uh, came up with a uh, fairly interesting uh, kind of 
criteria to evaluate and uh, to evaluate the potentials for the squeezing. Uh, this is shown uh, here in summary in this slide. If you look at this picture, this shows the uh, person strain the tunnel as a function of the rock mass uh, strength divided by the in situ pressure uh, in the tunnel. So this is also confirmed and verified uh, by some of the field uh, observations that they made. Uh, the black uh, points or dots in this figure indicate the actual observations in the field. And it's quite interesting to note that uh, uh, as uh, predicted when the value of the rock uh, max strength to the in situ pressure falls below a value of 0.2, irrespective of the amount of support pro provided by the support system, one should expect uh, to have significant amounts of uh, deformation for the tunnel. And uh, two extreme cases uh, and examples are kind of uh, shown here. Uh, the example that's associated with point one in this figure is the Yacombo Cuebor tunnel in uh, Venezuela. It's considered as one of the most challenging and difficult tunneling projects uh, in the world. It's a 16 feet uh, tunnel. Uh, in diameter and had significant uh, floor heave and also trapping of one of the, the rock TBM machines uh, during the excavation. Uh, another example is the tunnel in India that's shown here associated with 0.2, uh, 33 feet uh, span uh, tunnel with about three feet of uh, convergence or closure uh, as a result of the construction. So you can see some examples of the the tunnel uh, squeezing uh, potentials and issues that are quite well linked uh, to the ratio of the rock mass strength to the in-situ stress. So what I would like to suggest to take from this is simply this ratio and the fact that the lower this ratio uh, or the lower the strength of the rock compared to the in-situ pressure, the higher the potentials for squeezing and convergence uh, of the tunnel during the construction. And uh, such behavior can kind of be uh, sum summarized uh, in a graph like this. Uh, this uh, red graph or red curve shows the associated degrees uh, or potentials of squeezing and a strain in the tunnel as a function of the ratio of the rock mass strength uh, to the in situ stress. Typically, when the ratio uh, of rock mass strength to the in situ stress is high, we don't really expect to have uh, high values of strain. Uh, strain values of uh, one or even less are typically uh, not uh, very problematic uh, or concerning, but as the strain values exceed the value of one, we should uh, be uh, ready and prepared for, uh, or at least have some considerations for some degree of instability, depending on the, uh, excuse me, depending on the, uh, the different uh, levels of strain uh, associated with the, uh, with, the, with the ratio of the rock mass strength uh, to the in situ. So uh, here I have one example to just simply uh, provide an estimate of the degree of difficulty in terms of squeezing. So uh, let's consider a rock mass strength of 1.5 megapascal and the tunneling depth of 500 meter uh, using a conventional unit weight for the rock mass. Uh, we can evaluate the ratio of the rock mass strength uh, to the in situ pressure would be a value of 0.11. Uh, according to this chart, empirical chart, it's obviously is going to be a, a associated with significantly high values of strain, uh, something uh, beyond 10%, uh, which would be considered as the severe uh, type of uh, uh, potentials for the uh, squeezing. Next slide uh, shows uh, the relation, in fact, between the strains and the different uh, levels of difficulty. Like I said, uh, when the strain levels are less than one, Typically, no considerations of the squeezing potentials uh, would be needed, but as the strain levels uh, start to exceed uh, the value of one, uh, depending on the levels, uh, we should be ready and uh, uh, prepared for uh, different types of uh, support considerations, uh, both during the construction of the tunnel and also uh, as a form of final lining system for the long-term uh, performance of the tunnel. So uh, obviously it's required and re recommended to have uh, uh, some considerations for the stability of the face uh, when we anticipate to have a strain levels of five or greater, simply because of the fact that the face of the tunnel is anticipated to be quite unstable uh, because of these high values of strain that could be uh, uh, expected uh, to be observed in the tunnel. So with that introduction, uh, now I would like to focus on the 
the tunnel in the Venezuela. Uh, that's a very interesting tunnel. Uh, I have not been involved uh, either with the design or the construction of this uh, tunnel, but I have done a, quite an extensive review of the literature that Dr. Hook has contributed. Uh, he has been involved uh, with this research uh, since the very beginning. Uh, this is a 32-year uh, type, uh, type of construction that has, in fact, contributed to the field of rock mechanics quite significantly. So let's start with some of the basic information about uh, uh, this tunnel project. It's a 16-feet diameter tunnel, 14.5 uh, miles uh, long. Uh, like I said, it's located in Venezuela. The main idea was, or the goal has been to transfer the water from a dam site to a semi-arid uh, valley uh, known as Quibor. Extreme uh, squeezing potentials uh, were uh, uh, associated with this and squeezing problems uh, were observed in this tunnel, specifically in the phyllite uh, rock mass formation. Uh, phyllite is a type of uh, metamorphic rock that's uh, heavily foliated uh, that was uh, uh, exposed uh, as, uh, as the tunnel was advancing. Uh, and was uh, experienced in the tunnel. Uh, the site investigation has been quite limited uh, in this project, uh, especially in 1970s. Uh, they did not have the right equipment to perform so many borings uh, during the, uh, for the construction or at least uh, along the alignments uh, of the tunnel. So I think only three borings were attempted uh, prior to the start of the construction, but none of those borings could reach uh, to the level of the tunnel or the elevation level of the tunnel because of the uh, equipment and the technical issues. Uh, initially, the tunneling was started with the rock TBM machines, but uh, because of the squeezing in the tunnel, one of the TBMs got trapped and had to be manually uh, mined out of the tunnel, and this tunnel required uh, design, excuse me, designing a certain uh, innovative, quite innovative uh, type of support system uh, to be able to not only accommodate the ground deformation, but also be strong enough to support the ground uh, when needed. And I will talk about uh, that type of support system in more detail uh, in the following slide. And the final completion and breakthrough of the project uh, happened uh, in 2008. So it was a 32-year uh, long type of uh, construction. Let's have a look at the a cross-section of the tunnel here, you can see in this uh, slide that the cross-section is shown uh, in the inlet uh, portal as well as the outlet portal. The area that's shown here in the orange is the fault that was exposed and experienced uh, in the tunnel, uh, quite uh, extensive in, in length, about 750 meters of the tunnel was, uh, in fact, within the fault zone uh, in this area. And uh, you can see also a picture of the uh, the foliated uh, phyllite, uh, as you can see here in this picture, and also a, a small portion of the intact uh, rock specimen. So simply looking at this picture, one of the challenges that everyone can uh, observe or uh, imagine is uh, evaluation of the rock mass strength. Uh, such rock is highly foliated, really uh, damaged with several uh, types of uh, joints. So simply evaluating the quality of the rock mass and the strength of the rock mass uh, uh, is a challenge. Uh, for a project like this. And one of the main uh, contributions of the work of Dr. Uh, Hook was, in fact, the development of the geological strength index uh, classification method that resulted in a, a really a better understanding and evaluation of the properties of the rock. So here, as you can see in this figure and in this table, uh, we have uh, the estimation of the geological strength values uh, uh, for this uh, typical rock and based on the GSI values and also some of the uniaxial compressive strength testing uh, that has been done on the intact rock, the quality and the properties of the rock mass uh, was estimated in this tunnel. Uh, next slide shows the uh, shows a similar GSI care, uh, care for GSI chart that was uh, adopted for this project. Uh, the nice thing with this uh, kind of a specialized care or a specialized chart is that depending on the appearance of the rock uh, from the uh, observational uh, information, one can evaluate uh, a fairly narrow range of the GSI values uh, for the rock being exposed and then uh, use the GSI empirical equations and relations to estimate the properties of the rock mass, uh, being uh, mostly the strength properties that could be used for the purpose of uh, numerical modeling. 
Uh, here uh, in this table, you can see that uh, the estimated rock mass properties based on the GSI values and the hook run uh, criteria uh, are listed for five different classes of the rock, being A, B, C, D1, and D2. Two types of design considerations were uh, done here. Uh, one uh, design uh, was uh, two types of considerations of stability, I would say, uh, are considered here. One is the design consideration, which is essentially based on the short-term uh, observations of the freshly exposed rock, and the long-term is essentially based on the values of the properties of the rock mass, uh, considering the breakdown and the deterioration uh, that one would expect to happen for the rock mass as a result of the tunneling. So simply, again, going back to the main uh, uh, predicting uh, criteria that was proposed by Hook, uh, and knowing the quality and the properties of the rock mass as well as the in-situ stress, one can evaluate the potentials for squeezing based on the strain levels that uh, could be uh, predicted for this tunnel. So we can obtain the rock mass strain based on the GSI values, and the in-situ stresses in the rock can be uh, estimated based on the elevation of the, the tunnel as well as the amount of uh, overburden and the height of uh, rock mass uh, above the tunnel at a certain elevation, which uh, can be done by the use of the, uh, the geological models. And here, uh, as you can see on this uh, slide in the bottom right side, you can see a figure with the red curves and dots indicating the different levels of strain that the model predicts to occur for this project. And quite interestingly, in many areas, strain values of larger than one are estimated or anticipated. And those areas are obviously challenging areas because as we saw in the observational uh, data as well as the, the theory and the numerical modeling uh, strain values greater than one are indications of the uh, potentially problematic uh, tunneling experiences. So this was in fact confirmed by significant squeezing that happened uh, in, uh, in these areas uh, during the tunneling. One of the major challenges with uh, such a high squeezing potential is that uh, none of the conventional methods of uh, support needed excavation would work. Uh, so here I have some information about a uh, conventional method of shot creating. Uh, shot create with uh, the thickness of uh, 24 inch uh, with the compressive strength of 4,500 was considered as one of the potential supporting methods for this tunnel. And several scenarios were considered. Uh, scenario number A uh, or case A was the case of having the shot create installed very close to the face of the tunnel so it would uh, help the face to remain stable and uh, eliminate uh, some excessive deformation and kind of limit the deformation. This uh, scenario A seemed to be uh, uh, deemed to be insufficient because of the fact that uh, in this scenario the amount of pressure applied to the shot grid would uh, in fact exceed the strength of the shot grid. And another scenario was to uh, apply the shot grid quite far from the face uh, to the extent that it would be bearable in terms of pressure for the shot grid, but that was associated with significant amounts of deformation from the tunnel, and that scenario was also deemed quite uh, insufficient. So that was, in fact, the motivation for the group to come up with a more innovative type of design system. And as you can see in this slide, a yielding support system was uh, invented and used uh, for this project. Uh, the system is quite simple in design. It's a, a circular steel set with embedded uh, joints that uh, could accommodate the formation of the ground, but at the same time, when needed, uh, the gaps can close and, uh, in fact, uh, carry the load of the ground uh, to the support and uh, uh, restrict the formation of the ground. Uh, this is a type of uh, system that was used uh, very successfully, uh, especially on the circular uh, cross-sections uh, in the tunnel. And the next slide shows uh, the installation of this uh, ring system uh, during the construction as well as the final lining uh, that was uh, placed in the tunnel. So the procedure was the following. Uh, the circular uh, steel set uh, needed to be installed fairly close to the face, and some shot grading uh, used to be uh, done uh, between the sets. But uh, then the set would remain in place and the face would advance uh, all the way to the point that uh, the ground would uh, deform uh, 
to the point that uh, uh, would be uh, uh, would be appropriate to have the secondary learning system to be uh, installed, and then they would uh, continue with the application of uh, secondary and tertiary uh, shot grid layers uh, to the steel set. And what you see here on this uh, right uh, bottom figure is uh, the final uh, shape of the lining uh, that was installed uh, uh, throughout this project. And it uh, was uh, reported as being a very successful way of supporting the tunnel despite the significant squeezing that was uh, observed. So with that, uh, to kind of conclude what we uh, have seen uh, based on this experience, uh, the first item is that the stability problem in tunnels in poor ground uh, usually occur when the rock mass strength is less than one-fifth of the uh, in-situ stress level a method for estimating the severity of the squeezing uh, was reviewed in uh, this presentation. Uh, the Yakombo Kuiber Tunnel, uh, in fact, uh, was a very interesting project that uh, turned out to be very challenging, uh, but the uh, design of the yielding support system was a major contribution and, in fact, a major driving force for the completion of this tunnel. Uh, it was reported that the sequence of installation and activation of the support uh, was extremely important, and uh, based on the experience and the use of the yielding support system, such system can be extremely powerful because uh, not only it can accommodate the formation of the ground, uh, but also, if needed, it can be fairly strong and, uh, in fact, uh, powerful in carrying uh, the loads and limiting the ground uh, deformation. So that's all I had uh, for this uh, uh, talk. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for the attention. Uh, I'll be happy, very, uh, I'll be very happy to take questions either uh, through the Q plus A portal or uh, in, uh, via email through my email address. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Riza Hidayata. Um, let's see. I don't see uh, any questions as yet uh, from the audience. Uh, do, do you have some additional comments, uh, perhaps, Riza? Right, I just, yeah, one of the things that uh, in reviewing the, the, this case history uh, came to mind was that uh, this uh, use and implementation of the empirical system, although uh, it seemed to be quite uh, crude and rough, uh, turned out to be very, very powerful and very successful. Obviously, this would be uh, a great tool for preliminary evaluation of the support needed uh, and uh, for the problematic areas or cross-section uh, further analysis and more in-detail analysis using more sophisticated and more representative constitutive models can be uh, used uh, or done for the tunneling. I see. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Um. So, uh, okay, I don't see any more questions. So, so I, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Hidayat again for the presentation, and then I'm going to move on to the next one. Yeah, thank you, Riza. So the next uh, presentation is going to be given by Mr. David Scapato. He is president of Scarp Tech Incorporated, Rock Engineering Solutions in uh, Massachusetts, in the state of Massachusetts. So, Dave, I, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Ron. Much appreciated. Hopefully everything came up there in front of everyone. Um, let it push for a second. Let's see here. Yep. All right. So my presentation is focused on um, the implications from ice development on rock slopes. And it's something I feel that um, – has been overlooked, uh, maybe by the industry, probably not not intentionally, but it's something that comes up particularly in northern tier states. That would be places like New England, um, Canada, Alaska, um, you know, upper Midwest, and, and certainly out in the northwest regions and British Columbia and the like. So there's places like that where um, ice development on rock slopes can lead to problems. And I want to go through some slides, and I've got a bunch of cool pictures in here that's um, sort of highlight some of the things that, that I'm going to be discussing. So some folks on the call may have seen some of this information before, but um, I'm going to sort of accentuate it with, with updated information as we, as we go through. 
So the second slide, I think, is very telling. Uh, it's, a, it's a photograph or series of photographs of um, a project that I'm involved with in, in, in Alaska. And here you can see a, a rock slope uh, adjacent to a highway. And on the other side of the, the highway, you can see an emergency truck there. On the right side of it, there's the, uh, there's the ocean. Um, and so there's a very narrow corridor there for a paved roadway to, to work through with slope heights on the order of about 100 feet. And so back in 2012 in April during the spring thaw, there was a, a large slab of ice uh, that fell over and crushed a car. You can see the implications from that event in these two photos. And there may be a few others uh, uh, sprinkled through the presentation here. But um, this is one of those things that you don't, you, you know, you don't hear about commonly. Um, you know, a lot of the times ice, Ice can melt, and you know something that falls is gone 24 or 48 hours later. Unlike a piece of rock in a, a classic rock fault they've experienced. So you can see here, this is something that's definitely important. And so you've got ice fall hazards, and you've also just got the sort of the sort of impacts that ice has on rock in general, and can lead to increased uh, increased rock fall events. So uh, third slide here, you can see there's some terms that are used. Um, you know, this term ice fall, you know, the climbing, there's some folks in the climbing industry and, um, you know, geography, geomorphologist types that might use that term a little bit differently than I'm using it. Um, we're using it here in a little bit more of a classic rock fall context, just to describe a, a chunk of falling ice. Um, it's also, it's well documented in the literature from urban environments. Like if you were to look at, you know, the Sears Tower or places in Chicago or New York City, um, ice fall coming from structures is, is fairly common. You can see pictures of that if you do a quick Google search. So that's something that's out there. Um, but but ice fall events coming from rock excavations themselves are, are pretty pretty hard to come by in terms of finding research or um, online literature. And then you know more recently, we've definitely seen uh, an increase in, in ice fall events, and some of that may just you know, some of that's probably due to increased precipitation and things like that, but it's also due to the fact that we're we're looking now. We're actively looking for any evidence of icefall. There's places in Europe that, uh, in Norway, I'm going to show you a slide in a few minutes, where they do periodically deal with this. So slide four, somewhat of a continuation. You know, I talked earlier about how ice issues are, are ghost-like sometimes because you know, a chunk of ice could fall, it could damage something, and then you, know, you come out 48 hours later and you're like thinking to yourself, well, what, what damaged this? I mean, there's nothing here. The ice melted. So it's very challenging to, to sort of characterize ice fall uh, hazards along transportation corridors and, and the distribution of those hazards for that reason, because it, it changes, by the, uh, changes by the minute. Rockfall catchment ditches are generally not explicitly designed to uh, capture falling ice. They're designed to capture, as the name implies, falling rock. So um, that's something that I've been thinking about and, and looking at that and sort of incorporating that in various projects. So another thing that came up that was um, sort of an interesting topic was who does the responsibility for for ice development and ice fall problems on rock slopes, who, who does that responsibility lie with? Is it geotechnical engineers, rock slope engineers, avalanche hazards community? Uh, if ice forms from draining water upslope, is that more of a drainage and civil site design issue? Um, is DOT maintenance responsible for it in each state? I, I think that having something like this can cause a lot of confusion because there's a lot of folks who think that they might have some skin in the game, and, and they do. But, um, uh, you know, it's one of those things that it's definitely a team approach, but, but can lead to some, you know, some confusion. So it's been my position that ice falling off of rock slopes uh, adjacent to transportation corridors or in mines or pipelines and things of that nature it, it is, a rock, is a rock slope engineering issue. It's a, it's a rock slope engineering issue with a, a site, site drainage component to it. We did put together an initial paper on this. Ice fall hazards back uh, initially in 2011 and been working on it since uh, since back about 2009. So the next slide will show you a picture of uh, a sl another slope there in Alaska where you can see there's some sort of spotty ice development there. 
um, and that ice can, you know, it can it can take all shapes and forms depending on how it drains. It can be uh, unstable ice overhangs, slabs, increased increased ice fall incidents, and of course the ice itself can lead to jacking, just like root jacking of trees and root and, and you know other pieces of vegetation. Ice jacking on rock slopes, the jointed rock masses can lead to increased rock fall, and that is uh, something that we see a very strong correlation with. And then, obviously, you're going to get elevated water pressures periodically. If you get uh, if you get a heavy spring thaw and lots of ice, and the melt the rate of melting is rapid, um, you can get quite a bit of uh, uh, water coming out of the uh, you know out of the joints. So that's another thing to consider. Let's see here. All right. And then we saw this slide before, but it, this is a little bit more zoomed up. There's different sorts of, um, speaking specifically about ice fall here, um, there's different sorts of ice fall hazards. The direct impact, and obviously, as the picture shows, that's the most uh, damaging. You know, in this case here, that's where a chunk falls and actually imp impacts a car, a pipeline, um, or, you know, a mining facility, or there's direct point-to-point -point contact with uh, with something, uh, you know, like a vehicle. There are also other impacts that we see, and another one is shatter, and that's where you know, everybody who does rock, rock fall work will, you know, has probably seen this before, where, you know, rock initially falls, and then say it's a weaker rock, and it breaks up upon impact, and then throws, almost like fly rock from a blasting situation, throws that rock out horizontally and casts it, uh, casts it outward. So shatter is another thing um, that, you know, if your ditch is designed to accommodate shatter for rock fault, then, you know, um, if it's wide enough, like you see in the photo here, then that may not be a problem. But in places where you don't have a significant enough rock fault catchment ditch or a narrow uh, transportation corridor, the, you know, that shatter can be a real problem. Splatter is probably the least, uh, it's probably more of a nuisance thing, but that's you can see here, you know, if you get a muddy ditch or, or area where drainage water along a swale can build up, you can get um, chunks of or, uh, you know, clods of water and mud that can get cast horizontally. Um, and, you know, from a back analysis standpoint, understanding where rocks or chunks of ice fall and seeing corollary things like uh, chunks of rock thrown out 100 feet or um, splatter marks potentially going out 50 feet in front of where the primary event was can allow you to sort of go back and forensically retrace what happened and what you think the energetics of the situation was. So, so impact shatter and splatter are two sort of secondary uh, ice fall and rock fall uh, issues to deal with. So um, this is a, you know, after all, this is case histories. I'm sort of sprinkling some of these case histories through the uh, presentation here. This is the same, same photo I sort of started off with. Um, and there's that there's that truck again that was impacted by that slab of ice, um, and you know the occupant was seriously injured. Uh, and you know one of the tricky things about ice fall that I get into a little later on is that um, from a triggering mechanism standpoint, you, know, you could th there's lots of different things you could look at. You could look at uh, you could look at the temperature, uh, which has a big effect, you know, on the spring thaw. But ultimately, it's the loss of adhesion between that contact between the rock and the ice. When that adhesive contact starts to degrade is when we start to see that ice moving. And so characterizing that, that, that release surface between the rock and the ice is a very important thing. And it's difficult to quantify. Yeah, in this photo here, the observers who were there that day put the uh, the slab dimensions at nearly 100 feet in height by anywhere between 40 and 60 feet and slope parallel width. So uh, it was a pretty a pretty big chunk uh, that came down. That was in Alaska along Seward Highway back in 2012. There are other rare documented incidents of ice fall. One here happened the year before in Alaska in 2011. Um, in, in, in BC, in British Columbia. And that was where a bus was impacted by a large slab of ice that came off of a mountain face. Um, no fatalities in, in that situation. The driver of the bus, as the photo would show, was definitely um, injured. And of course, it shut down a, a highway and there was a, a railway and a river and things like that right along the, uh, right along the highway. So all those were temporarily shut down until they could sort of figure out what's going on. 
Um, there's other sites specifically that have been addressed in Maine, uh, northern Maine, with ice fall, uh, potential ice fall issues. And then also in Norway and Switzerland, and there's some pro project write-ups by uh, GeoGroup uh, on that subject. So just some more photos to sort of show the issue. Um, and then, so ice fall ferry, ferrier mechanics, you think about it, you know, we, it's a fascinating subject to think about, you know, how, how, does a, how does a rock slope failure initiate? You know, there's, there's the, that first second, right at the moment of incipient failure, some, something happens and the slope fails in a certain way. And then that, uh, as Marty showed earlier on, I mean, that, that can cascade into other sorts of uh, failure events, whether debris flows or mud flows or what have you. In this case here with ice fall, um, you can get discrete uh, blocks of falling ice. That's definitely something that, that can happen. I mean, occasionally outside of railroad tunnels, you hear about folks in Alaska and other parts of the country where large, um, large icicles might build up at the portal of the tunnel. And so the, um, those, those may need to be mitigated by pulling down or scaling or, or whatnot. But um, falling, just falling of discrete blocks of ice is, is definitely one, one way, and it's a very common way that we see ice fall uh, failure mechanics. The, the overall slab, if it's a larger water, frozen waterfall type structure, could topple, it could slide, um, and then frequently you'll see a, a loss of, it becomes a bearing capacity problem at the bottom of the slab of ice as the uh, temperature rises and as adhesion uh, it is lost between the rock and the ice above. Now all that weight from that slab is concentrated on the toe of the ice block, and that will lead to crushing and loss of uh, uh, a toe support. So, and then I, I touched on this loss of adhesion. That is uh, uh, one of the most important things to consider with ice, uh, ice stability, ice fall failure mechanics. So the next thing we look at is, well, okay, well, how do we characterize ice fall hazards? I mean, it's kind of a tricky thing. I mean, how do we model it? Um, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to, to assess, but we have to, we have to start somewhere. And sort of one initial assumption that I, I tried to work off of with doing some of, the, some of this project work is, well, uh, you know, what's out there that may, maybe it's not perfect for doing ice fall analyses, but something that potentially could be used to, to give us an initial uh, guess at what's going on. And so using rockfall, uh, rock, rockfall modeling programs could be useful. I mean, one thing that rockfall models don't account for, uh, at least a lot of the conventionally available ones, is loss of mass or a, sort of a reduction of, of mass um, as the rock block or as the chunk of ice falls down the slope. Because as it's falling, it's breaking up and there's material being cast out and, and the size of the block is typically, um, for weak rocks and ice, would be, would be breaking up. So there's definitely challenges in using things like CRISPR rockfall, but it is a way to sort of uh, run a bunch of iterations with some simple assumptions and see, geez, how does this compare to the chunk of ice that we found on the road? And, you know, is there any sort of comparison there? And so it's a place to start. The challenge, the, the, by far the most challenging aspect of using um, some of these rockfall programs for modeling chunks of falling ice is that you have to remember that in the spring, early spring and late winter, when things start to melt, um, the problem is that frequently roadway ditches are choked up with ice and snow from the plows. And so you have to model a whole bunch of different conditions relative to slope roughness. If there's, if there's snow on the slope um, or if there's snow and ice in the ditch area, um, coming up for tangential and normal coefficients of restitution is a real challenge. Um, so that's a tricky part, I think. There are other types of uh, industry software that, that could be used out there. Um, you know, like I said before, it doesn't assess things breaking up on the way down and mass reduction. There's probably some discontinuum or distinct element methods that could be used. I have not attempted those yet, but those are uh, on the radar screen. And, um, you know, a big part of it also is the constraints I was talking about on coming up for a value of adhesion, and of course that's related to some, <clears throat> excuse me, some thermodynamic constraints between the rock and, and 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 the ice. And so, for example, if you have an ice slab on a on a dark colored rock versus a, you know ice on a light colored granitic rock, say, um, the dark rock tends to heat up faster, and as a result of that heating through conduction, 
you get the loss of adhesion along that contact surface. And so, you know, there's things thermodynamically that need to be considered too, as with temperature and uh, time, obviously. So industry state of knowledge, uh, you know, we reached out initially to a whole bunch of different states and uh, we, we struggled finding folks who had, uh, who had to deal with this issue. It, it's not something that is um, that, that's common. Like I said in, in the introduction, ice fall hazards are not something that we, uh, that we see frequently. But I certainly see them in, in various states in New England in, in, uh, during the spring melt and in the ditches and things like that. Uh, let's see here. And uh, so the location and development of ice is not always consistent from year to year. Like I was mentioning before, the distribution of where these things develop is really challenging. If you're looking at a 10-mile long transportation corridor, um, you know, the, the ice development from one year to another is not always in the exact same location. And so uh, it's a challenge uh, sort of geographically to sort of, um, you know, make sense of that. And then sometimes ice fall events, and I think all of us who do any slope work realize this happens a lot in the media. You get on a you know a media you know news, and you say, oh, it's a rock slide or a mudslide somewhere, and all of us are looking at that and we're going, that's not a mudslide. What, what are they talking about? Um, that, that frequently comes up. Same thing with ice fall. You'll see it as falling snow or ice slides, or sometimes it's just recorded in media reports as an avalanche. So it's my opinion that the quantity of ice fall events is likely underreported. Uh, it's underreported because people don't tend to look for it, and it's also underreported because it may only be in the ditch for a period of a couple of days before it melts. Ice fall hazard assessments, um, initial monitoring of ice buildup conditions during the winter and spring months is really, uh, really important. Um, there's things you can do on the slope during even the summer months to look for signs of scoured bedrock stripped over burden soils, uh, polished rock slope surfaces, things like that um, can, can be good indicators of cons consistent ice development from year to year. Uh, and identification of upslope water sources and snowpack, uh, all of those things have a big impact on where ice develops. And in my opinion, I think if there's two things you could pull out of this entire presentation, um, other than maybe being introduced to it, it's that adhesion component to stability um, along the rock to ice contact that's critical. And then it's also identifying upslope water sources because as we all know, if there's no water, if there's no free water available, then, um, then you're really, you know, really reducing the, the chances that ice can develop in, at that location. Okay, I have four more slides here, so we're getting close. Um, so ice fall hazard assessment, so where potential source areas from ice have been identified and you know, in, in those spe specific locations, maybe formal monitoring programs should be established. And you know, that formal monitoring um, may just be something that's written down on paper, but it could just be visual. Um, it could be visual monitoring. Somebody who's going along a corridor and just periodically once a week or once, or once a day, depending on how prolific the hazard may be. Um, and just just keeping an eye on and making you know, important important notes and records on that sort of thing. There was some talk of trying to incorporate icefall within the climate climate component and a rainfall component of uh, something like a rockfall hazard rating system approach. Um, and that's something that's sort of hasn't been worked out yet. Uh, I think it's it's challenging in certain places to you know to do that. Some places it may make sense, but um, just that that that's that work is ongoing. And then, of course, there's risk assessment, you know, and that's where you're essentially looking at, you know, you know what the hazard is. The hazard is falling ice, falling rock. The risk aspect of it is, well, what is the chance of that falling rock and falling ice actually hitting a vehicle that's traveling um, at a certain rate of speed or, or what's the frequency of vehicles coming by? Um, that, in that situation, you're looking at probability of impact. So getting into different mitigation uh, alternatives. There are source zone treatments, and so source zone treatments are treatments for ice, uh, you know, ice development up where the ice is forming. So you're essentially saying, I'm going to let the ice, uh, or I'm going to, I'm going to remove the ice from its source zone. That'd be similar. It's kind of a similar to a rockfall approach. The mitigation options could include scaling, slushing with a large uh, mechanical device, 
Uh, in some cases in Alaska, they'll use uh, trim shot, uh, trim shots. They'll drill. They'll actually drill holes in certain um, places where ice are, is overhanging tracks, say train tracks, and shoot it off. They'll actually use a, a, a light, uh, like a blasting approach. Saw cut joints or possible use of impact cannons like they uh, might use for avalanches, something similar to that. It's a ballistic sort of approach where you can knock off uh, knock off unstable pieces of ice. Topographic alterations is a big one, um, and that could include a, a total slope redesign, which we all know is very expensive and maybe not practical in certain locations. But what about what about regrading the top of a slope so that you can funnel water away from uh, um, away from the slope face so that ice doesn't develop? So uh, if upslope water is the problem, as it is in many issues with ice development, then you know these sorts of grade or topographic alterations upslope may make a lot of sense. So surface and subsurface drainage enhancements um, that can include internal drains that may be drilled or or swaling in certain locations to divert surface water. Let's see here, all right. All right, and then this is the impact zone treatments, right? This is, this is basically saying, okay, for example, we don't own the right of way, so we can't do anything more than 50 feet or 100 feet or whatever it is off the center line of the roadway. Very, very common with, uh, with DOTs where you might like to go up and do something in the source zone, scale something off or bolt it in place, but the abutter or the other property owner basically says, I'm not going you know, it, it, to let you do it, or it just takes too long to get the permitting to work out. So in this case, you, you would say, I'm going to let the ice or rock fall, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prevent it. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to manage its horizontal movement. And so in, you know, in, that, in that instance, you would be allowing the, the pieces to fall, but you would be managing how far they can move. So a rockfall type barrier approach is another thing that could be used. We looked into this uh, initially in, in New England. Um, an anchor netting system or drapery could be used, but the problem with drapery is that, I mean, it works for rockfall, um, but with water, especially when it's melting, that water and that ice can kind of move through the aperture, the opening in the mesh, and it could, uh, in my opinion, it probably would o overstress the netting particularly when things start melting, you have a whole bunch of ice adhered to the mesh, which would not be good. The photo you see on the right is a photo um, uh, from the Norwegian Ministry of Transportation, and they have a really cool, I don't know how much you can zoom in on it, but you'll see it's a drape type approach. It's a slot, it's a slotted method where they use what are called standoffs. And the standoffs are, are pieces of, of uh, rock bolt, they're bars that are standing out perpendicular to the rock face. They might be drilled two to three feet in and on a certain pattern. And the intent is to capture ice falling from up above. Um, and so that's a, really, that's a really neat way to consider ice fall hazards. Additional impact zone treatments, of course, there's the, uh, the dedicated rock fall type catchment ditch, um, and it could be used for ice and rock fall. It's just that typically they are designed for rock fall. And, um, you know, you would have to think about the, ge the geometry and block size of ice that could potentially fall if you wanted to include that within your rock fall catchment ditch design. Think other things you need to think about are um, annual ice development, probability of ice development based on um, climatology, potential for ice failure mechanisms, and the behavior of ice blocks when those blocks are going to hit snow or ice or, or saturated, you know, soil that might be in the ditch. Um, you know, the, the, the attenuation of that fall energy is going to be diminished different depending on what, what the uh, ice block impacts. Okay, two more slides here. Uh, rock slope design factors for ice fall mitigation. So, you know, there's existing versus proposed slopes. Those are things you need to think about. Is it something that's going to be blasted out? Is it a new slope that you can consider? Or is this a slope that's already there and now you have to sort of work with the geometry that's given to you? Um, assessment of upstable, uh, upslope snowpack and drainage pathways. And if water sources are not controllable, then you really have to, to, um, to jump to the next thing, which is looking at the potential range of ice failure mechanisms that might impact the highway. This picture on the right shows that same stretch of highway um, south of Anchorage where you can see there's some ice 
um, from that same event that's uh, being being cleared from the roadway. The other thing is, you know, is it an isolated singular block? Is it a six foot block of ice that's going to fall down? Are you talking about a frozen sort of tower of ice that could be 10 or 15 or 20 or more feet high? Um, and, you know, how would that fall? And so that's a challenging thing to, uh, to sort of wrap your hands around. So concluding slides here. Um, ice fall hazard assessment, it's, it's definitely in its infancy. It's not something that is uh, well established yet, but I'm trying to, I think by getting the word out there, those of, those of us who do rock slope design and do design catchment ditches can, in the northern tier states, can start to consider this. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing to think about. Uh, there may be GIS-based asset management tools that could be used to sort of look at and track these uh, hazards and where they develop along transportation corridors. Slope monitoring is absolutely critical. And if, if that's, I don't want to say that's all that should be done, but I'll, I'll tell you, if, uh, if, if, if uh, people are out there actually looking at these things and keep, keeping good photographs and good notes on, um, on what they're seeing, then th that, that information is worth its weight in gold, especially to a slope designer. Slope design cold regions should also consider the effects of um, ice development, including slope deterioration, like I was talking about before, that sort of freeze-thaw, freeze-thaw effect will and does induce additional rockfall in many areas. And so if you have a highly fractured rock slope and you have ice problems, um, I would think over time that is going to be sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy where you get increased rockfall. Rockfall catchment ditch design in a cold region needs to consider ice, ice failure mechanisms and ice fall capture. All right, so last slide here. For existing slopes with occurring development of ice slabs, conventional rockfall ditches may not work. And that's something that needs to be considered based on the geometry of um, the geometry of the area and then also the geometry of potential failure uh, a slab that could fail. Slopes with high surface roughness appear to retain ice for longer periods of time. Now, that, that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, like I was saying before, you've got more, you know, the higher the surface roughness, the more surface area do you generally have for the, that adhesive bonding along that contact between the ice and the rock. So, um, you know, that, that's something that definitely makes sense, and, um, you know, we, we see that in the field, too. Presence of upslope water sources like snowpack. Uh, appear to be very significant in, in um, you know, uh, development of ice because that's where all the water is stored. And once melting takes place and refreezing at night, um, that can cause a, a significant ice development problems. And so currently right now, uh, we're continuing work with Alaska DOT and, uh, and some private clients relative to ice fall hazards and, and uh, various solutions. So I hope, I hope to have more to add to this over the next year as we sort of wrap that research up. I think there'll be a lot of good things discovered. And this is just my parting thoughts here. I took it right to the last minute at, at 1.35. So uh, I'm going to just say a special thanks to Alaska DOT and everyone um, for joining the call today. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it back to Ron. Hey, uh, Dave, we do have a couple of questions. If you want to, uh, you, yeah, it's been a minute or two. On it? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so let's see what that says here. Uh, the first question says, I read that the person hurt in the ice fall was successful in their lawsuit against ADOT. And, and what has ADOT implemented as part of managing and considering ice fall issues? And so my work in Alaska right now is relative to the event that took place um, and looking statewide at hazards like, like this, like icefall, so that we can come up with a um, coherent sort of long-term strategy to deal with, with the location where the ice fell, and not only that location, but also other locations across the state uh, where, where they may exist. So. The research I'm doing right now is meant to answer the question that was just asked to me by Doug, and, and we hope to have answers here over the next uh, next six, six months or so. But I would also just add this, that the area specifically where the ice fell on the Seward Highway is also subject to uh, a tremendous amount of monitoring in the, in the late winter and early spring now. So until we get these sort of solutions um, you know, down and on paper over the next six months, then um, this area gets monitored and there's a traffic diversion pattern that's been put into place 
that uh, that gets implemented depending on what they see. So if there's like this year, there wasn't a tremendous amount of ice out there from from our monitoring, but if there was, um, now they have sort of an action plan where they can say, all right, you know, we know that temperatures are going to be over a certain threshold over the coming days. We are going to implement this traffic pattern where traffic gets pulled as far away from the slope as uh, as humanly possible. So that's that's the interim solution and the long term solution. Mm-hmm. And then the second question says, in, interesting presentation. I was involved with a project that had a uh, large cell tower with cables that would coat with ice and shed ice chunks under certain and rare weather conditions. Building a base, building at base of tower had to have protect, protective roof. Okay. So, yeah, there are just like with rock ball sheds, um, they get used frequently over in, in Europe, plus Switzerland and places like that. Um, there's been talk of, of putting some sort of an ice fall shed in place where, you know, you can dev- design the structure to actually withstand chunks of falling, uh, falling ice. That's not something that I've been um, involved with myself, but I, I know it is something that does get used in certain parts of the world. It's, just, it's not something that's common here in the U.S. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dave, uh, Dave Scapato of, uh, of Scott Tech Incorporated. Thanks, uh, Thank Dave, you. again, and uh, we're going to move on to the next uh, and uh, our last presentation, okay? So Thank let you. me introduce uh, uh, Dr. Fulvio Tonon. He's an associate professor of geotechnical engineering at the University of Udini in Italy and also a principal engineer uh, of uh, Tanon USA, engineering measurements and testing. So, without further ado, uh, Professor Dr. Tanon, I'll give it, uh, turn it over to you. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Ron, for your kind introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Fulvio Tanon, and today I will talk to the 56 of you that I see here still in attendance about uh, applications of uh, photogrammetry to rock engineering. Um, so these um, are really coming from my uh, practice, uh, and so I will start off with uh, some background on why photogrammetry um, and how it compares with LiDAR that was mentioned in the first presentation. And um, I hope that will that will help clarify some of the differences and uh, the reasons why you should use one versus the other in your applications. And then we'll look at uh, two major applications from my uh, <clears throat> portfolio of uh, um, um, rock slope applications. One is in uh, Colorado and the second one is in Italy. Uh, so rock falls actually happen in uh, uh, both in Europe and the United States, as you may imagine. So uh, what is, um, or by the why have I been interested in, in photogrammetry? Um, well, I have to say that uh, from a technical viewpoint, mechanical viewpoint, I prepare some uh, um, animations and I just found out when I uploaded this presentation on this system that animations do not work. So you'll see just the animation scrolling through at uh, turbo speed as I, uh, as I just click on the, on the slide, unfortunately. Okay, in any case, what you see here uh, is a, uh, uh, a 3D model of a rock mass uh, quite clearly. And you see two fractures. Uh, the uh, fracture on the top, okay, has been digitized based on the fact that there is a plane, a, a rock plane that sticks out of the rock mass, okay? And that can be easily done uh, whether you use LiDAR or you use photogrammetry. Uh, what is trickier is the one at the bottom. Why is that? Because in that case, you only have the trace of the uh, uh, of the uh, of the fracture. 
so the trace is the intersection between the fracture and the rock surface, so it's a 3D curve. And the only way to see that is by using high-resolution color photographs. And so, oh, you say, well, with LiDAR, we do have that. Well, the problem with LiDAR is that the photograph is always offset with respect to the uh, underlying 3D model. What does it mean? As you go on the 3D model to try to digitize that fracture based on what you observe, on the uh, on the color photographs, uh, you will be digitizing something that has nothing to do with the actual 3D curve that uh, would uh, give you the orientation of the actual fracture. So uh, the reason why I've been interested in photogrammetry is exactly this, because with photogrammetry there is a one-one correspondence between the uh, photographs and the underlying geometry. And the reason is that you actually, in photogrammetry, you create the 3D model, the 3D mesh from the pixels, and so you know exactly where pixels should go, uh, and that is not the case with, uh, with LiDAR. So for my point of view, since I have to sign off uh, and I have to put my stamp on the uh, reports that I prepare, I don't want to uh, um, give out uh, um, data that is not correct um, just because of uh, uh, artificial uh, um, uh, attitudes of the fractures that uh, are created by the uh, technology, okay? Um, okay, so that's the why I've been interested in photogrammetry and um, The system is much slower than a common presentation. So here is the uh, animation that goes at turbo speed. Okay. So um, how is photogrammetry different different from a laser scanner? That's a typical question that I get all the time. Um, so first off, uh, we have seen that the uh, triangulated point cloud is generated from the pixels, and it means that the pixels. Uh, can be attached, glued to the 3D mesh, okay, um, one, one, with a 1-1 one, one correspondence. So, uh, and that is really critical in uh, rock engineering uh, applications where we use the 3D model and the pictures to detect uh, fractures and to uh, determine the orientation of the fractures. Uh, the other big difference in my mind is that uh, for each pair of photos, um, we have a measure of the accuracy of our model um, that we don't have with, with LiDAR. Um, another point is that the uh, um, accuracy and the density of our uh, point cloud are really a uh, input parameter from the client, is not a uh, constraint given by the equipment. With LiDAR, when you buy the equipment, you buy the accuracy and you buy the uh, point density for the rest of your life as long as you use that piece of equipment. Uh, but with uh, photogrammetry, uh, if you really know what you're doing, uh, and I will expand on this in a moment, uh, um, y y you can really uh, design your uh, field acquisition uh, data acquisition so that you achieve the accuracy uh, requested by the client uh, with the point density that you need for your job. Um, and I will show you both the examples uh, that I showed to you um, are really a, uh, a testimony to, to this point. Uh, so you're no longer a slave, okay, to a piece of equipment. Uh, you can uh, tune and design your uh, data acquisition to achieve the, uh, the goals that you need for that specific application. Um, uh, the, the other point that we're always interested in in, in rock engineering application is the resolutions, uh, the resolution of the photos. Um, and of course, here we're talking about uh, slope applications. Um, the other major application field that I have is, is tunnels. But uh, in, in this case, uh, really, photo resolution uh, is a problem with LiDAR because, uh, as you can see here, uh, the uh, the pixel on the ground uh, is something that is pretty much unusable at, uh, say, one kilometer, uh, which is a 
typical distance uh, for uh, for uh, slope applications. Uh, so we're talking about uh, uh, six inches, okay, of pixel on the ground that, that you essentially don't see anything at, at that point. Uh, Regal, uh, the uh, VZ6000 is the uh, Top of the line, uh, they it's advertised to four kilometers, uh, but at one kilometer you are down to uh, say uh, 60 millimeter ground pixel uh, size. So uh, if you're trying to look at uh, fractures uh, and especially uh, um, um, traces of fractures, uh, you're essentially doomed. Um, Another thing that is oftentimes overlooked, uh, and uh, I, when you buy a laser, a lighter uh, piece of equipment, or somebody comes to you uh, advertising uh, their services using lighter, please, please, please uh, look at these specs, okay? They are in the uh, spec sheet of uh, each piece of equipment, so please ask for that piece of paper and read it and understand it. Uh, so any LiDAR instrument projects a cone, okay? It's not a cylinder, it's a cone. A cone is something that has an aperture angle, so the farther you go from the instrument, the bigger, okay, the halo will be on your object. So if you have a rock slope and that's your application, uh, each instrument will, uh, at a certain distance, uh, project a halo, and the uh, and the and the data will come back from within that halo, say with 90, 95 percent probability. That's something that's in the spec sheet. So what does it mean in practical terms? As you can see here, at our magical distance of one kilometer, uh, you're looking at a uh, halo on the ground that goes from four inches to uh, six inches. What does it mean that the uh, the um, the, the point on the ground may be detected anywhere within that circle, and, and you have no control, okay, no control whatsoever where that point is coming from within that circle. And so uh, that means that you're essentially blind, okay, within a circle of that dimension on the ground. Uh, so if you want to believe that uh, result, then, well, go ahead. Um, another point of interest, uh, people say, oh, I, my ladder is uh, one centimeter accuracy, accurate at uh, three kilometers. Oh, gosh. Well, look at this. Just look at how they can level the instrument. Um, for example, the eyesight has a 20-second uh, accuracy in the way that they can level the instrument. It means that at one kilometer, they're off by uh, 250 millimeters. Um, that is more than eight inches in the vertical direction. So that really blows away any centimeter accuracy that anybody can claim on using LiDAR. Uh, the Regal, uh, if you buy a uh, um, additional inclination sensor at one kilometer, you are down to uh, uh, to, to six inches. Um, so it, it, uh, that is, once again, uh, the error in the vertical direction. And so if you try to use this for monitoring, you, you can just see from these two sources of error, uh, you, you have a uh, halo on the ground that is from four to, uh, to six inches, and then you have a vertical inaccuracy that goes from uh, eight to uh, six inches. So yeah, if you want to believe that for monitoring, go ahead. And then you have all the problems with registration and angular accuracy that moves the whole point cloud to the left or to the right uh, pretty much uh, to the same level as you have problems with leveling. So um, uh, I think I, 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 I had my cell pitch here. Um, Let's move on to slope applications. The first one is in Colorado. Um, so. Uh, the, uh, this slope is uh, just on the uh, west side of the uh, west portal of the uh, Hanging Lake Tunnel uh, in Glenwood Canyon, um, and then uh, a few miles 
down the road to the west is Glenwood Springs. Um, so this baby is composed of a Precambrian granite basement. So uh, for once in this web conference, you'll hear a geologic term. And, uh, and then you have a Cambrian quartzite, okay, that sits on top of it. And actually most of the problems really come from this quartzite that is dissected like sugar cubes. Um, and um, over, over time, several uh, um, events occurred. Uh, this is really old dated by now. Uh, dates back to uh, uh, 2012, something like that. So uh, um, these are the uh, locations where uh, blocks came down on uh, Interstate 70, and uh, the portal for the uh, the west portal for the um, uh, Hanging Lake Tunnel is pretty much here at this location. Here there is uh, there is a set of ramps that take you to uh, the Hanging Lake uh, uh, rest area that is pretty much uh, uh, to the uh, uh, right lower lower right corner here on the, on this slide. Um, so the uh, a few events um, occurred. One was in 2004. I'm looking I'm just I'm recounting the uh, most recent ones. And uh, um, in, in this case, the uh, cost to repair was about $700,000. Uh, and the, the big problem was that the road was really closed. The uh, I-70 was closed for uh, uh, several uh, weeks, and uh, that entailed a 200-mile uh, detour. That means a four-hour detour in narrow country roads in, in Colorado. Um, and the next event, six years later, uh, there we go, pretty much uh, the uh, same deal. Um, and uh, just to show you an example of how these rock blocks look like, uh, that's what it is, okay? Um, they are as big as a, uh, uh, I would say, a large truck. Um, and uh, as you can see, they punch a hole on the deck of the I-70. Um, so that's essentially uh, what the uh, rockfall looks like uh, after the event. Um, and the big problem with this slope from a uh, imaging viewpoint is that the only place where you can see the whole slope is uh, that tiny uh, spot there. Uh, we're now looking at the uh, um, mountain that is opposite to the uh, troublesome slope. And uh, if you zoom in, okay, you go there with a the helicopter, um, that's essentially what you see, okay? It's a four meter by four meter um, space that you have at your disposal, and in fact, the helicopter cannot even land on it. You just, you just jump off on it. Uh, so they tried to use LiDAR, and because of what we said before, uh, they had no luck. Uh, they also used uh, um, radar, but uh, because they pointed the radar, uh, the uh, radar uh, di directly horizontal, okay, on the slope, they could not see anything. That was just dumb. Um, uh, that means that they didn't know what, they, uh, uh, they didn't really understand the technology, but in any case. Uh, and so um, here we came with the idea of using photogrammetry. Uh, so what the mandate was to obtain a uh, 3D uh, georeference model accurate to 2.5 centimeter to an inch. Uh, that had to be uh, proved by putting targets on the ground. So it's no uh, um, just rambling, uh, it's real accuracy. Um, the objective was to use then this model to detect movements of the slope. Uh, the problem is that this slope is a big baby. Um, it's uh, 550 meter wide, 450 meter high, uh, nearly vertical. Uh, it's in a very, very narrow canyon, poor visibility as we have seen. Um, the only vantage point is from one kilometer away from the other side of the, of the canyon. Uh, and the other big problem is that this slope is not flat, okay? It has big concavities, and so there are, from anywhere you look at it, you have problems with shadowing. Okay, so, um, okay, so what we did was, uh, was this. Uh, we designed, and I really want to stress this, uh, in photogrammetry you really have to design your data acquisition. 
Uh, with LiDAR, uh, you can essentially place the instrument and press a button. That is not the case with photogrammetry, um, especially if the uh, conditions are so difficult as this one. So you really have to understand how photogrammetry works. And uh, if you never understood what the bundle adjustment is and resection is, I would say don't use it. Uh, nowadays, there are wonderful software packages, and people can go out, buy a camera, and show the pictures on a piece of software, piece of, uh, press a button, hope for the best. Uh, there's a big hype now with drones, so people go out, buy drones, show their uh, photographs on the, uh, on the piece of software, push a button, and hope for the best. Uh, well, that is probably good for cartoons, not for engineering. Um, so in this case, we uh, designed how we wanted to take the photos uh, to overcome all the difficulties that we have seen. So eventually, we used 350 photos. Uh, the pixel on the ground was uh, half an inch, and uh, we had 16 survey targets on the slope uh, to make sure that we achieved the accuracy that we wanted. Um, and that is the big difference between uh, creating a very nice cartoon and, uh, and engineering, okay? So uh, the first survey was in March uh, 2013. Um, the, we had two total stations to uh, measure the uh, location of the targets, and the differences between those was about nine millimeters, okay, um, less than half an inch, uh, three quarters of an inch, and uh, the residuals, uh, that is to say the errors of the uh, photographic model on the uh, 16 targets that we had uh, were, had a, was a total uh, of 21 millimeters, so less than a, a one inch. Remember that the uh, mandate here from the client was uh, better than an inch, and sure enough, the uh, accuracy that we delivered was within that model, that within that constraint. So once again, that is a proof that if you do things right, you understand what you're doing, you can achieve the accuracy that you want, even in extreme conditions as this one. Okay, uh, so all was fine. That, that, so that was our baseline, okay, for the monitoring of this slope. And then uh, in August, um, C dot said, well, we don't really want to survey the targets anymore because uh, in any case they will not move. And uh, so we just want to take the photographs, okay, so we'll do that. Uh, the problem was that actually those targets moved. Uh, and so um, we were able to uh, determine the residuals of our um, photographic model by using the coordinates back in March. And so that gives you a uh, quantification for the uh, movements of the targets. But we try to play around with uh, the different targets, eliminating some, retaining some others to understand whether just a few moved. But eventually all moved, and so uh, CDOT really did not choose well in this case, and they should have uh, resurvey the targets if they really wanted to then use this model to uh, uh, detect uh, movements in the in the whole slope. Um, back in and then in November, uh, once again, they did not want to uh, um, uh, survey the targets just to take photos. And as you can see, the slope is moving more and more. Uh, in this case, the errors are four times as big as we had. Uh, uh, right surveying the targets, and that is once again an indication of the movements of the slope, uh, but because CDOT did not want to uh, survey the targets, then uh, we, do not, uh, we are not in a position to determine the uh, uh, displacements uh, in the uh, whole slope, as actually that was the objective. Okay, um, so CDOT said, uh, well, these are screenshots from uh, the 3D model. Unfortunately, this system does not allow me to uh, uh, show you the 3D model live, which has been the meat of, our, of my presentation. So that's the upper part, the quartzitic uh, part of the, uh, of the slope, and I'm just going to zoom in in that red rectangle. And just to show you what you may see as you zoom in in the 3D model. So this is not the picture. This is the 3D model. 
And these are dimensions of, this, of the block. So you can see that you, you have anything from columns that are about uh, 30 feet high um, to blocks that are just resting pretty much anywhere on the slope. Um, and then if we just look at another location, this rec rectangle here on the slope, we zoom in there, it seems small at this scale. But if you look at the dimension of the block, uh, that is just hanging, okay, uh, by some residual uh, bridges, rock bridges, on its top and on the back here, uh, you can clearly see that this is one of the big babies that come down with a six-year return period and punch big holes in the, uh, um, in the deck of the highway. So, uh, and it's evident that uh, its brother just uh, uh, was released a few years ago uh, and is no longer there, and probably this one is next in line. Not only that, but you can see what's on top of this rock block. So if this big rock block falls down, then they really have uh, all the uh, smaller blocks up here that will uh, fall along, and that is not small babies either. Um, so all of this you can really quantify by using the model. And so CDOT, for some reason, said, well, we don't really need this thing anymore. And sure enough, six years uh, after the 2010 event, um, like a clock, uh, another rockfall event uh, of the similar dimension occurred. And then a CDOT engineer went out there to look at the slope and said, no, no, everything is fine and uh, the uh, area is really stable, no problem, just let the cars go, vehicles go, and sure enough, the next day, that's what happened. Uh, so that's so much for stability uh, that CDOT um, uh, put their hat on, and so uh, that is another big slide, uh, the size of the rock blocks you can see, and uh, just by comparing to the same eye that they knocked off. And uh, uh, once again, big closure, big detour, and so on and so on. Uh, estimated cost between two million to five million. And so, but really, who needs to, to survey the targets, right? Um, just why do we want to spend a few thousand dollars for this? Um, so the other application uh, is in Italy um, and uh, as I said, rock falls really happen all over the world. Uh, so this is the boot um, for Italy, and we're right there where the red arrow points us. And uh, we're on the northern side of uh, Lake Garda. Um, and uh, what I'm highlighting here in red is uh, the unstable slope that we were asked to, uh, um, to take care of. Uh, the problem here is, once again, rock falls. Um, and so this is the last event uh, in order of time. Uh, you can clearly see in the upper part uh, of uh, the detachment area, and then uh, you can see one block is sitting. Um, fortunately, I really cannot point with this system. Uh, I really don't have a pointer. Um, a rock block is sitting uh, just next to this building, and uh, there are the different uh, pictures that show uh, a block that knocked off in a corner of this building and then the other block that flew over the, uh, the building and then without making a lot more damage just uh, sat on the, on the ground uh, over there. Um, so that's just an enlargement and uh, that's a, uh, uh, the uh, block that knocked off the uh, the corner of the building and smashed a few cars here in the parking lot. Nobody was hurt, nobody died, but um, in any case, that was just the last event in many years. And so the purpose here was to identify uh, and survey all unstable blocks. Uh, we need to provide the uh, uh, location of the unstable blocks, the mode of failure, uh, the uh, mass of the block and uh, the location, and then map all fractures. So um, in, in this case, just to give you an idea, the whole slope is uh, two mile long, and the height of the rock part uh, goes uh, 
up to a thousand feet. So it's really a large, large surface. There's no way that you can map it uh, manually. Okay. Um, in this case, the uh, residuals that we got uh, with our photogrammetric model on the targets on the on the ground. Uh, was about an inch in each direction. Um, in this case, I also tried to do something uh, because some software packages uh, and some vendors, uh, they said, no, I'll calibrate the camera for you and I'll give it to you and you can go for as long as you want. As long as you don't drop it, it'll work fine. And sure enough, for this project, for example, I would have had residuals, that is to say errors, okay, on my targets on the ground, uh, greater than, uh, well, in excess of three, four feet. Uh, so you can clearly see that uh, there are so many things that can go wrong, uh, and, and calibration is really one essential part of uh, the photogrammetic exercise. Um, just to give you an idea, we uh, used uh, nearly 1,300 photos, and the pixel on the ground was similar to the uh, Colorado uh, application, about half an inch, if you will, to three quarters of an inch. And in this case, we went completely from the ground uh, to acquire our data. And uh, with that, um, I duly subdivided my whole slope in uh, different quadrants, and then uh, I uh, duly uh, um, um, carried out my uh, fracture um, mapping, and uh, I know if you've ever seen uh, over 7,000 mapped fractures on a steer net, but this is what it is, okay? And, and each one of them, I did it by hand. Uh, there are other vendors that would tell you, oh, yes, I have this fantastic piece of software. It will map the fractures for you. Just push this button. This is all bullshit uh, because uh, I try them. And unless you are in a perfect, wonderful granite, uh, they will not work. Uh, and, and sure enough, they will not detect any traces. I remember, we started from that. So, uh, and, and the other thing is that we come back to the old adage, you really have to put your signature at the bottom and put your stamp. So if you want to believe a piece of software you have no control of, go ahead, but I don't want to do it. So I uh, map all my fracture by hand. I'll stay there. I, I, I'll just stick my nose on the, on the screen for a couple of days, but I, I, I really want to live with this, uh, with this slope and uh, have a relationship with it before signing off on things. Um, so there are... Uh, Three major, let me go back one second here. Let's talk a little bit about rock mechanics here. Uh, there are uh, three major sub-vertical uh, sets of fractures that you see here from K1 to K3. Um, and, uh, and then there are uh, sub-horizontal ones, the SS1 and then the SS2, slightly uh, inclined. SS2 is also a bedding that was... Uh, um, subject to a uh, folding mechanism in the uh, west part uh, of the slope up here. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, I cannot go through all the details of uh, the uh, implication of uh, the different orientation of the fracture for this slope and how they relate to uh, uh, rock fold mechanisms, but uh, this is just to give you an idea of uh, one of those quadrants, it's quadrant 11. Um, and the uh, different fractures that we mapped um, and all the unstable blocks that, uh, that we um, identified on the ground. And next, I'll show you some examples of uh, those typical rock blocks and rock block mecha uh, rock fall mechanisms. So one is my mechanism that we found was poles, okay? So w w essentially um, throughout the slope, we had fractured planes that were parallel to the slope. And that was a major uh, mechanism for blocks, such as this one that you see on the slide that just detached, but a uh, few of them are still hanging in there. Um, and the last event, the 2014 event, was exactly this one, okay? It was a, uh, a spole that eventually uh, gave way and came down. Um, so that's another example. Uh, a spole occurred and the rock block just fell down, is no longer there, but there are other brothers here that are just waiting a few more years to come down. Uh, so that's one mode of failure. Um, another one here where you see one, two are more recent spoles, and three is more ancient one. 
uh, just to give the client some also, um, I would say, um, clarification that uh, these type of freedom mechanisms really occurred in the past. It's not something that we invented out of the blue. Uh, the, the other type of, uh, of problem in this slope was overhangs. As you can see here along the bedding plane that there's been erosion over time, and so the rock blocks are really over, overhanging, and that in, in red here I highlighted a uh, – a, a block that fell down some time ago, um, but a big one is the one that is really highlighting in, in green here. Um, uh, okay, that's a, a big baby. Uh, that's a thousand cubic meter. Uh, on, on the ground, this has a, uh, um, on, on, okay, on the valley down, uh, it has a uh, Potential energy equal to 6,000 megajoule. Um, just to give you an idea, the largest rock fence that you can put up uh, can handle 8 megajoules. So here we're over 700 times that potential energy. So 700, no 700, 7 times, but 700 times. So these babies, as, you can, as they come down, they, they really break havoc. There's no way to, to, to stop them. Um, and this is a big, big column. This baby here is 1,000 feet tall uh, by uh, um, 30 by 30 feet, and uh, the foundation of it is all eaten out, and, uh, and so this is really just next in line. Um, and then this is another type of column uh, with a arch at the bottom, and you can see these uh, uh, orange fractures here, uh, they are really caused by the uh, stress concentrations at the uh, haunches of, uh, of the arch. So there is so much that we discovered by looking in detail at, at this slope in terms of uh, failure mechanisms and, uh, um, and induced uh, block failure. And uh, in the karstic part of the, uh, of the slope, uh, fractures were not planar, but uh, they were curved like this one, so uh, some blocks really had a banana shape, if you will, like this. Um, and these were toppling, okay? Th this is really looking for, uh, to the model from, from a side to highlight the uh, toppling mechanisms. Uh, this is in the west upper part of the, uh, of the slope. Um, and last is wedges, okay, uh, typical wedges um, that are isolated by uh, three or more fracture sets. Um, and the other thing that was nice to discover is that when you then zoom out, okay, you really discover that there were, that there were um, many um, uh, composite failure modes, and I think I really need to cut it short because we're running a little bit over. Um, but, and then what I did, just as a preliminary analysis, I put the potential energy, okay, um, um, uh, for the different types of mode of failure, and I counted them, um, and so the, uh, uh, the, the the red bar, the part, the red part of the bar, really is the uh, uh, the count of blocks with a potential energy that is greater than the eight megajoule. That is once again the largest um, rock fence that you can put up. And just to give an idea, that is also equivalent to a uh, um, uh, to an embankment about say, uh, 30 by 30 by 30 feet, something like that. Um, so th that is substantial um, structures that we're, we're looking at. But still, as you can see, especially for the spoles and, and the overhangs and the, and the wedges, uh, there's no way you really can stop them with uh, those tiny little engineered um, measures. And, uh, and then I say, okay, like, let's suppose that, that these blocks tumble down uh, and they lose a lot of energy. Um, so that the energy coefficient restitution, this is not the uh, usual coefficient restitution, this is the energy. So each time they'll lose uh, 35 to 50 percent of the energy at each impact, which is really a lot. They really want to push it to the other stream. And still you can see that there are many blocks that would just destroy uh, any, any rock fence that you can put up and any embankment that you can put up. Um, so uh, to come to conclusions, uh, with photogrammetry, really, I as you can make I perceive I really love it uh, because you can uh, re achieve the accuracy that is given by the client that, or, or, or that you want to achieve. Uh, you're not constrained by a piece of instrument. Uh, I, really not, I really don't like to be uh, uh, bossed by, the, uh, by technology. 
Um, you're not constrained by ground topography, uh, especially uh, now with uh, uh, UAVs. Um, um, it can be used with uh, vertical uh, faces, steep canyons, even if the uh, slope is concave. Um, the uh, end result is the uh, 3D georeference triangulated mesh with texture with high resolution pictures. And the key point is that the, uh, those pictures are uh, uh, attached, perfectly attached to the 3D model. So we can really rely on it for your rock engineering applications. Um, we have seen the different results that uh, can be achieved. And uh, last but not least, what we have done is to uh, specially develop a, a UAV um, so that we can no longer, uh, we don't have to go on the slope to put targets and survey those targets and resurvey those targets uh, at each, um, each time that we want to monitor the slope. Uh, there's no need to, to rent a large helicopter as we had to do in the uh, Colorado applications. And, uh, and we're talking about similar accuracies to what we have seen here, okay? Um, and, uh, and the other thing is that we can highly improve the uh, constraints in the model. Uh, so, for example, we would essentially use 350 control points uh, in a slope as big as the uh, uh, Colorado applications. Um, with that, I uh, thank you for uh, attending and bearing with me for, uh, um, for this time. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to handle them. Thank you, Fulvio, for interesting uh, presentation. It seems like a very useful tool uh, for the grammetry. Uh, we do have to wrap up, but uh, there was uh, there were actually let's see a couple of questions. Maybe can you handle? Can you see the question? The the, the last one about the software that uh, you use, and maybe. We can touch on yeah, that. Right. Yeah, it's a, uh, what we use really a combination of different uh, pieces of software. Uh, some are commercial, uh, some we developed, and especially the uh, um, 3D mapping of the fractures and, uh, and, and, the, and the identification of unstable rock blocks. That's something that we developed. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, it's really a combination, but most of it, Really, when it comes to the engineering, rock engineering applications, mm -hmm. uh, it's something that we developed in house. I see. Great. Thank you very much. So, uh, one more Thank note here: uh, a video of all the four presentations will be posted on the GI YouTube channel next week. So, if you want to revisit some of the slides, some of the presentation, you can do that. With that, I'd like to thank all the four presenters today uh, for, for the wonderful presentations. I've learned a lot, and I hope everybody enjoyed as much as I have. Uh, the web uh, conference that uh, the Rock Mechanics Committee has put together this time. So with that, I'd like to thank one more time our gold sponsor, Hayward Baker, who is the North America's leader in geotechnical solutions with a network of local offices across North America, each with direct access to the largest geotechnical knowledge base in the industry. Hayward Baker is ready to respond with the optimal solution wherever the location, whatever the size, whenever required. Solutions include foundation support, sediment control, concrete improvement, slope stabilization, underpinning, excavation, shoring, Earth retention, size and liquefaction mitigation, groundwater control, and environmental remediation. So Hayward Baker is part of the connected companies of Keller, a multinational organization providing geotechnical construction solutions throughout the world. So with that, I thank everybody for attending. We have a good audience uh, today. I thank everybody for sticking with us. Uh, the whole time, and I thank uh, the GI as well, the ASC GI or the staff, for helping us uh, put this together. We hope to see you in the near future for another web conference. Okay, with that, uh, we conclude the web conference this time. Thank you very much. Thank you. This does conclude today's conference. Have a great day.